What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. So pumped to be talking about the universe is thinking. We have Charles Lindsay joining us on the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming on, Charles. Nice. Thank you. I'm so Glad pumped for this. Excellent. It's been a long time coordinating. I'm yes. glad that this is finally landing. Yeah. Spur of the moment. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. I yeah. agree. For those who don't know Charles' background, Charles Lindsay was the first artist in residence at SETI Institute, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and is now the director of SETI's Artist in Residency program, where he pairs extraordinary artists with leading astroscientists. He's also the author of Recipes for the Mind, his eighth book of photographs, where his word clouds merge with image artifacts of art, tech, consumption, NDEs, wildlife, psychedelics, time travel, failure, courage, and AI. You can find his main link in the bio below, charleslindsay.com, as well as his Instagram link and the link for the Recipes for the Mind book. All right. Charles, whew. We must start things off with one of our favorite questions that we love asking our guests. Are we really all one? I'm going to say yes, we are. I don't think there's any other answer to that. And if we're not, we're in trouble. Well, we are in a bit of trouble, aren't we? So, yeah, I think we probably are one. And what gives you the insight into that? Observation. Simple observation. I don't see how it can be any other way. Yeah, I think the breaks come when we are when we uh, when we lose that connection or the awareness of that connection. Yeah. So, but we're going to talk about whether the universe is thinking us into being or not. That's coming. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So then, what is the point then of this creation of this reality that we're immersed in? I don't think there is a point. I think it's just an expression of the universe thinking. I think we're just one of an infinite number of expressions. We being life on Earth, not just the, the, us humans mm -hmm. or us humans in California or, or whatever. Could it be a process of coming more alive? The universe, the creation becoming more and more alive through all of these? Yeah, in some, in some way of speaking, I suppose it is. It's, uh, you know, listen, one of the reasons that I'm an artist or I call myself an artist is it's this... Um, you know, existential umbrella under which almost anything's possible. It's sort of the, the self-identification moniker that allows um, a lot of synthesis. It's what allows me to move in between hard sciences and any kind of expression in art and yes. go from poetry and back to being a researcher in a rainforest or in the Arctic. So, I mean, these questions are, are central to what I'm doing and... and I'm I'm looking at them from different angles and different approaches, and I've seemed to have found a way, particularly at the SETI Institute, to do that, to have the the freedom and the access and the ability to to think about these questions. Yeah, yeah, I love how you describe the synthesis between the science and the spirit, with the art, with the creation that you get to you get to beautifully express yourself in such a unique way that's so needed bringing those two sides of the same coin together and then you also you know we also kind of endeavored into it a little bit but this this uh this creation could potentially be making all of these experiences so that we can become more alive it can become more alive and we can experience all of these different creative outcomes and explorations and consciousness the illusion of separation all of these things i think that's right i mean i think we are it's 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 not just so we can become more alive perhaps it's so that the universe can be come more alive you yes. know we're just like the top of the broccoli we're just yes. we're fractal and growing perhaps that's what i meant by we yes, yes. yeah sure yes, yes we the broccoli the, the, the we <laughs> we the big we the big <laughs> yeah, us right. the I absolute Yes, yes, yeah. that big one. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think, you know, if you, across the board at the SETI Institute, these scientists are, they're asking the hard questions. They're pushing the membrane between what is known and what isn't known. What a perfect place to have artists involved. Yes. You know, among other things, I think the artists are, you know, they're symbolizing that push into the unknown. Um, and, I, and I think one of the differences with perhaps with art and, and science, and, and, and again, I'm not interested in a, in a 
in a situation where there's a siloing, I'm interested in a de-siloing, where mm-hmm. these things merge and mix. Yeah. But I think that, that, you know, the art is asking, is often asking questions or posing questions mm-hmm. where science is seeking answers. The answers are iterative. Every answer leads to another question. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps in the arts, every question leads to another question as well. I don't know. But... Um, Ooh, I love that. But it's, Science it's, is seeking the answers. Art is posing the questions. Yeah, perhaps no different questions, yeah. but maybe not so different as well. Also, the nature of art has changed dramatically in the last, what do we call yeah. it, 10, 20 years. There's many ways to be an artist now. It's, it's obviously blossomed compared to what would have been a, hundred, you know, a mere century ago. And, um, and that's very exciting. There's so many ways to be artists. So that's one of the things actually at the SETI Institute we're encouraging is is different ways of being artists. Some of that could be new media and technology, but not necessarily. And I'm looking forward to diving into that. I want to ask along the way, then, does it feel like the root cause of so many of the issues that we have is our feelings of separation, that we don't feel that deep amount of interconnectedness? Well, I guess the question is, who do you mean by we? That means we, humanity at large, mm, much of humanity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because maybe it is that the plants and the animals all feel constantly interconnected. Well, you know, there's that, cla- you know, the leopard doesn't question its spots. One of the things I learned is, um, you know, in my 20s, I started living every year with a, a Stone Age shaman in Indonesia. It sounds bizarre in this, and it, and it was in many ways. Wow. But I met this this man who was my age and and was living, you know, bark loincloth, bow and arrows, and one of the things I, I and I and so I spent basically about two months a year there every year for eight years, and then that resulted in my first book, and I went back a couple of times. And um, but one of the things that the animists seem to figure out everywhere that animism arose, which is everywhere you had early humans, yeah. was they seemed to be in balance with nature in general. Yes. It seemed to be figured out. In, in the group I was with, there were... They are not you know, separate. Anthropologists called them the most taboo-ridden society ever known. But those taboos somehow led to these checks and balances in their relationship mm-hmm. with the environment. Mm-hmm. And so when we talk about this separation, it is kind of strange and in some ways pathetic that humans evolved away from that knowledge. It's, it's really as though, you know, intuitively we kind of got it right the first time and then moved away from it. And then in some, in, in, in some ways, some humans, I think right now are moving back to it. I mean, this, you know, you start with interest in organic mm-hmm. foods and going back mm-hmm. to where soil is alive and perhaps mm-hmm. not using Roundup and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But um, you spent a lot of as, time with yeah. sh- shaman in Indonesia. Two months every year. Yeah, with one shaman and one with clan. one shaman. But and then one I also clan, at that yeah. time as I was more of a photojournalist, and my interest was really in these early peoples. So I spent a summer with Inuits, who were the last legal whalers. Wow. And um, I was in Japan with the Matagi. They were the last of a of a thousand-year lineage of bear hunters. They used to hunt the black bear in Japan for gallbladder, you know, for Whoa. medicine. So I was very interested in this relationship um, between these early peoples, how they thought about nature, felt about it. You know, these people that were really in touch. And so I began that in my 20s, and I knew at that time that those uh, the groups living in that sort of authentic, original way were going very quickly. You know, it was, and, and, and it's almost gone. And yeah. so I, I, I knew that I had to get on it. And, and obviously I learned a lot being in those places. And it's influenced to a great deal kind of who I am and I suppose my personal philosophy now having been with those people. It's also very interesting you talk about separation or what we are. And, you know, so that shaman I lived with, was he was a brilliant individual. His whole worldview was different than mine and mm. his, his bank of experiences was different. Mm-hmm. But that was, you know, that was... The, just one of those uh, experiences where you where you see really how similar we are, you know. Yeah, that was that was striking. 
Wow. Okay. So that was crazy. So you did it with um, in, with Indonesian shaman. You went to uh, Japanese bear hunters as well that have been doing it for thousands. Of yeah, years. I went and I spent. Uh, I mean, it took a couple of years to get access, but I spent one spring with the last great hunters. They were about seventy at the time. So I went in, you know, into the mountains with them when they were bear hunting. Whoa. And uh, they would, it was very funny when you entered, there was a place where we went, it was in Akita, uh, um, it was in Akita prefecture in the, in the north. So, you know, like Akita, the, the dogs, of course. And so the place of the mountains where they went bear hunting, there was a river and all the men would come down and the, and it's thought that the, that the main goddess of the mountains was a, was an angry woman. And she didn't want, she was uh, jealous, and so she wouldn't let women into the mountains, only men. So these hunters would go down to the river in their traditional gear before going on the hunt with spears and this kind of hunting. And they would all flash the goddess. They would all show their wanger across the river to the goddess. What? Just to show that there weren't, they weren't women because they thought if, if, if she knew that there were women coming into the mountains, you know, she would be <laughs> malicious. But she liked men, so they thought that, you know, anyway, so that was, yeah, that was quite Wow, what a ritual. Yeah. There's so many crazy, interesting indigenous rituals like yeah. that. Um, Endless. You gave also the um, the Inuit example of yeah. the last uh, whale hunting. Yeah, they were Give harpooning a- beluga whales, which is, you know, awful to witness. And, and I mean, they were not living in a, in a you know, the real traditional Inuits had been gone a century by the time I was there. In Indonesia, I found, a, you know, very remote people that were living the way people lived 10,000 years ago. And in Japan, it was, it was somewhere in between. In, it, but there is a deep feeling of animism, uh, like all the spirit from them. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that it, animists believe that everything is animated, right? Everything has a spirit from a rock to a tree to a human. And and classic to that belief, and it's it's so interesting that that belief, you know, sprung up everywhere that humans did, is is this idea that when your spirit becomes displaced from your physical body, that's when illness enters, and so the shamans are often in this role of of pulling the spirit back to get the evil out. It sort of it repeats through so many of these cultures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of levels yeah. to it, but I think you know one of one of the things that's that's just been personally fascinating is is in my lifetime to have gone from living in the stone age like that for yes. real yes to then doing research at nasa ames yes. and yes. 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 and all this hybrid activity and you were in, in, in uh the arctic in the arctic as a young geologist as a young yeah. geologist as well yeah. so it's yeah exactly it's so interesting juxtaposing the um living amongst indigenous tribe and then going and doing cutting edge science yeah. it's very interesting and it totally gives us a better understanding of who you are and how you became who you are today and why you care so much about these two sides of the same coin coming yeah. into light um also another thing that i think is really important to mention is that like another way to juxtapose like indigenous interconnection compared to our very deep disconnection in like our metropolises uh light pollution can't see the cosmos sure i'm not growing apples i'm exchanging a sheet of paper for an apple when i take a sip of water take a breath of air or bite that apple i don't think about the interconnectedness between the sun and nourishing that apple's energy and me eating that apple for energy we completely lost that process of interconnectedness and now we have all of the issues with that feel those feelings of separation the mental health issues no more uh doesn't feel like there's inclusive fitness between us anymore there's so much more self-dealing so we're trying yeah. to fix all those things with like inclusive stakeholding and gift economics and all this other kind of stuff does it re- do you do see like how do you see that juxtaposition like the indigenous interconnectedness and the metropolis disconnectedness i mean of course we see it one of the things that was that was you know one of my observations when i went back to see the those tribal people because i tend to go i'd I basically say, you know, I'll be back in a year, count it, 12 moons. And I go back every year. And one of the things that always struck me was, and, and, and this is not some sort of idealized, you know, savage sort of, you know, the noble savage idea. But when I went back, the people there were either very healthy or they were dead. You know, and sometimes you go back and say, where's so-and-so who was an incredibly strong guy? Yeah. And maybe he died of a snake bite or a virus. And, 
but they but they had this health and and one of the things that's 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 coming out more and more now is how our microbiome works and of course that was established mm-hmm. you know our digestive tract was established something like 40,000 years ago and then it's only in the last century even less than a century that our eating habits changed into all kinds of other things mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that's uh, that's very interesting territory definitely yeah i'm glad you bring that but, up i mean we i mean you know these studies you know we it might be I longer. Mean, we or dirt. It we could we, be billions of years in terms of digestive tract from the uh, initial sea creatures that then made it onto land. That then, of course, continued having their digestive tract and eventually, well, sure, there's a ch- it's, eventually it's, monkeys. There's a chain. Us. Yeah, there's, there's a, a big chain. chain. Sure. And if all root, uh, much of root of disease does start in this in this incredible microbiome, then yeah. we need to be very vigilant in the last century about self-dealing habits of food companies, of pharma companies, of it's no longer mom that's giving you food. It's now it's a sure. big food that's trying to give you sure. some of the... And then, you know, circling rooms. back, you know, I love this idea that, that you know, cells on and in our body are an or- order of magnitude greater than the cells that are supposedly us, Right. But this is even this way of it's a very it's this siloed way of thinking. It's still like this us and them thinking. Nonetheless, it's quite interesting. It does seem like, and we talk about this so much on the show, that by really tapping into the root that we think is of all of the problems in the world, by tapping into the interconnectedness, by making more feelings of interconnectedness around the world from both the top down billionaires and government leaders, corporate leaders, as well as the grassroots everyday people, and really trying to f- make more feelings of interconnectedness, we think that that may solve, that is the root, and it may solve all of the other uh, symptom issues down the, down the line down the water supply well i think that it's it's a matter of timing do we have time for these things to you know aggregate and have a positive effect to overcome the very serious environmental mess we're in right now but i don't i'm not sure that's what we're talking about tonight maybe we're talking about kind of is though about the universe thinking it's in a sense is that this collective consciousness is starting to feel the the acidification of the oceans starting to feel the deforestation i mean phytoplankton sure. contribute to 70 percent of the oxygenation on sure. the planet when we feel that we feel in peril we feel in danger so then the first thing that we do is we're like okay alarmism how do we make sure that we don't die and we can live a plan a place for our yeah. children so in a sense it is this this uh deep interconnectedness that is coming more alive because of this pressure cooker sure yeah well i think you know the point you made casually but i think is actually profound is this idea that that i think at this point we can say the majority of humanity or we're close live in urban centers where they don't see that starry sky that humans evolved with and and so therefore the the questioning the sense of wonder that goes with that simple observation it's not so simple, actually. It's profound, but imagine that yeah. you know, something like half of humanity doesn't experience that. Pretty strange. Yeah. On the other hand, yeah. you know, electrical lighting is pretty Incredible. magnificent as well. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. So, but I don't think anybody's yeah. look. Very yeah. few people are looking at lights, going, you know, how does that happen? And you know, you know, speaking of like, you know, ego death, like <clears throat> looking up at those stars. I mean, when you're looking at the entire Milky Way in a completely non-light polluted area, is a very fast way to have ego death happen. Sure. Deep feelings of interconnectedness. Have you had experiences of ego death? Yeah, of course. I mean, I spend a lot of time in nature. And, you know, sort of the more primary nature, the better. And whether it's through that or through psychedelics or... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's actually... It's, 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 I would say it's a fairly familiar state. And what what comes up for you when you when you feel in nature psychedelics or however how, what comes up for you what is that feeling describe it to us? Well, it's just it's feeling at one with rather than outside of the of the system, you know. And so Boom. I mean, ego suggests this this separation, and so when the separation goes away, it doesn't have to be. I mean, ego death sounds very dramatic. It doesn't need to be dramatic at all. I mean, I also had, I've had a number of them, but I had two profound near-death experiences when I was 20. Mm. And, and that changed my life as well, because that, with that was just a, a fundamental comprehension that 
this whole deal that is the me being alive can end at any time, fraction of a second. Yeah. And when you deeply comprehend that, I'd like to think, you know, we live, you know, differently. I mean, it's affected, it affected, I mean, it's, you know, I never forgot it. Can you give us a little taste of the NDEs? When I was 20 in the, in the, it was my first year of university. It was in Canada, University of Western Ontario. And we were nearing final exams. And I had just, uh, through a program, it was University of Western Ontario in London, great school. And there was a program to put young uh, would-be geologists in the field. So I decided I wanted to be an exploration geologist because I imagined when I was 18 and 19 what career would take me to the ends of the world and into nature and pay me to do it. So I, and I also liked the, the, the time spans that were approached in geology. I found geology aesthetically really interesting, philosophically very interesting. And so it was the end of that first year and I developed, all of a sudden I developed a really high fever and my lymph nodes all went rock hard and I was diagnosed as having uh, Hodgkin's disease. And so it was, it, I, I had just gotten this job in the Arctic, which was supposed to start two weeks later, right at the end of that semester, a summer job, which also would pay for my way through university. And um, so I went in and, and there was the first series of biopsies and, the, and the, the doctor said, don't worry about it, we have the best radiation treatment in the world. And at the time, really from when I was 16, I, I, I picked up a sort of a tattered book in a used bookstore, it's called Silva Mind Control Method. And it was a, a kind of meditation that was developed by a man called, called Jose Silva. I picked it up in the 70s as a teenager. It was from the 60s. And it, um, I taught myself how to lucid dream out of that book. Yeah. And that Silva mind control, I don't know if you ever had, you know, it's become something else now, I don't know. But you, you practice dream control, and uh, it's a kind of meditation that's highly visual. So it was, in that way, it was uh, somewhat opposite of transcendental meditation. It wasn't geared to go to a null point and a kind of an absolute quiet, but rather it was highly visual. It was almost like, I mean, it was, I did that and, 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 and was very good at it very quickly. And, um, and when, when computer graphics came along, I felt like I'd already been there because I'd done so much of this visualization through lucid dreaming. Anyway, I decided, you know, I had this high fever and the doctors are saying it's, you know, going to be fine. And I sort of said, no, bullshit, I'm, I'm not being sick. And I put myself in this, in this dream state and went through a very sort of Joseph Campbell power of myth sequence of, I mean, it had, it had just four distinct parts. The first one was was like Kwaikutl masks, you know, Pacific Northwest Indian masks in this dark, scary scene. And then I was on these giant rollers on the ocean on my back, also very ominous. And then it broke through into this sequence of walking through just infinite flower, you know, fields of flowers, very psychedelic. And, and then and, and I woke up out of it and the bed was like a soaked sponge. It was really soaked. And I just knew I was fine. And then I went in for the next set of biopsies the next day, and everything ran clean. The doctors were befuddled. Whoa. And I just said, well, I'm out of here. So I went, you know, I got on a plane up to the Arctic and then a, and then a ski plane and, and a helicopter. And two weeks to the day from that, that, um, that lucid dream, that, that self, you know, auto-healing sequence, which was obviously incredibly profound. Yeah. I was out in this area that was just white as far as white could be and, yeah. and pretty flat. And the, the, um, I was out with this geologist. It was all helicopter-based work. And there was a, a storm was coming in. So the helicopter came out to get us. And the pilot came in a little bit too close and was hovering and had a white out. And so he's at full RPM. We're on a frozen lake. It's just white on white. And he thought the rotor blades were coming towards us, you know, full RPM, loud. So when he corrected, he flew, he threw the blades into the ice, and the helicopter exploded away from us. No. So we're standing there, myself and the senior geologist, you know, not a scratch, but the helicopter's right there. It's 40, 50 feet away, you know. So you had this huge noise, this profound quiet after, and then like a low buzz, and we pulled him out. He survived, which oh, was unusual. Oh, he did. Oh my. But anyway, gosh. there was you know, it was in two weeks, there were those two experiences, in and the, that yeah, was in two just weeks. you know, I mean, I was already reading you know 
Herman Hess and a lot of psychedelic related things and, and, and Eastern mysticism. I mean, I was already on my way, who knows where, but that stuff was really a kicker. I mean, that was just like, you know, there's just no time to wait. You got to yeah, go. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, there's been lots of experiences and close calls since then, but that wow. was just kabam, you know? Whoa. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. Whoa. And I love how you said there's no time to wait. There's, you get two and a half billion seconds or heartbeats in an 82 approximately year lifetime. So what are you blueprinted for? Yeah. What is your unique gift to bring to the world? Identify that and then parse your world to find other people and strategies to help bring yeah. that gift forth. And so let's ask. What are you blueprinted for? What yeah. is your? I mean, I think this, to, to follow what you said. I mean, I think it's you know when when I think of that 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 sort of push that energy to go out. I, I mean, I don't think of it as something manic, but I do think of it as something sort of consistent. I don't think I have one blueprint. Some people clearly do. Prodigy musicians. What are the parts prodigy here? Prodigy mathematicians the to the you know? blueprint. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So these are like but singular. I'm, an, I'm an explorer. I mean, I'm just a, mm -hmm. a, I'm just a curious you know little hunk of silly putty i'm 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 very curious curious hunk of silly putty. but i've also been able to <laughs> occupy you know i mean the geology you know there is a in it with the with the beauty of hindsight there is some consistency the geology allowed me to explore and make a living and put my way through school and then the photographs of wildlife i made as a young geologist of you know grizzly bears and polar bears and muskox and that type of thing because we're in these areas that that humans weren't and you know any knucklehead with a camera and kodachrome in it could take some good pictures and i ended up selling some of those photographs and then right after university you know i took off for southeast asia i worked another summer i could save about ten thousand dollars a summer work seven days a week for for four months and so i had ten thousand bucks and i just went to southeast asia until the money ran out which was a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so I went and I photographed, you know, with the idea of how would one become a photographer. My ideas about photography then were very much influenced by National Geographic and that yeah. genre of imaging, yeah. which I did in some ways. And then over time, you know, I, I, I grew, you know, my approaches to photography, my thinking about imaging grew. But, but the camera was this tool that basically allowed me to get micro educations in many areas. And so, you know, after a couple of years, at which point I based in Tokyo and mainly I was working in Southeast Asia because I just liked the weirdest places in the world. And, and I always thought of that kind of as that kind of that work as time travel, you know, being able to go into the Stone Age in Indonesia or in India or Nepal at that time. You could go places that were tr like medieval Europe. And so I was very intrigued with that. And I was also interested in trying to photograph things that people hadn't photographed, which was still influenced by a by a you know the early explorer mentality i mean i think now what's happened and now i'm, I'm jumping way ahead is that you know so much the, the geographic earth has been covered by photographers mm -hmm. now it's being covered by drones and mm -hmm. satellites and all kinds of things so so then at that point if you're an explorer and if you're making you know if you're using imaging techniques call it photography to to explore then what do you do and that's, you know, that's how I ended up doing my carbon cameraless work and the processing mm -hmm. and recipes for the mind. Well, anyway, that's a lot of information up front. Let's also then um, pull up some of this as you're, as you're explaining it. Okay, so we have here, we can, you were just mentioning the carbon work. Sure. Yes. Okay, so this is all available on charleslindsay.com. You guys can find it there. But yeah, explain to us what, what is this? Well, carbon is a, a cameraless process that I discovered, and the the negatives I'm making are very much um, uh, uh, they are a hybrid between a kind of drawing and photography. So the the image qualities are highly photographic, but the source image is not made with light sensitive film. It's really a kind of microscopic drawing that I figured out to do with an emulsion that I developed. It's something, it's carbon based. It's very much like an ink. And then I did some, some mucking with the chemistry. And in fact, it's actually a good thing to go to because like the image you're looking at now, it was uh, those images that Jill Tarter, the famous you know, astro scientist saw that led to our conversations where she then invited me to the Allen Telescope Array SETI's, you know, uh, observatory up in northern california nine years ago 
Wow. And, you know, yeah. we, we met in New York and she saw my images and, and asked me what these were. And we had this conversation and, and you know, being Jill, a super generous person who's become a very, very close friend now, said, you know, so what can I do for you? And I said, you know, Mrs. Tartar, you don't need to do anything. You're a, you know, you're a hero and inspiration. And, and she said, come on, you can do better. I said, I'd like to go to the observatory. So I showed up at the observatory and I brought some really good, you know, California red wine. And all of a sudden I'm walking around in the, in the array at night under the stars with yeah, Jill yeah. Tartar having yeah. conversations about, you know, the nature of life and the meaning yes. of life and yes. all that good yes. stuff. Yes. And, yes. and then basically that led to me becoming the beta test for, you know, the first artist in residence at SETI to see what, you know, That's what so would cool. an artist do? Yeah, it was incredible. What fortunate. a cool story, though, incredible also fortunate. that she saw this, invited you up. And well, then, and Jill's, yeah. Jill's um, you know, if you think about it, and, and, and any of the, the SETI scientists that are really uh, thinking about or looking for the signatures of technologically advanced life elsewhere, which could be radio astronomy or, or optical astronomy, you know, looking for uh, rapid burst laser or something like this, you know, it's, it's also this exercise of being open to what you don't know. I mean, there is a question inherent in the SETI search, I think, is that, you know, this would be my language for that, but it'd be if ET was hovering in front of us, would we even recognize it, she, him? Would we even, re if it was hovering right in front of us, would we even know? Or would we just think it's, you know, cotton candy? Well, we wouldn't, you know. So, so I think Jill was interested in the images because they were images of things that she didn't know. It's also very much in a, it's in a language of scientific imagery. It's, 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 it could be electron microscopy. Yes. And I think some people sometimes, which is its own interesting question, you know, could dismiss things that they see as just scientific imaging. You know, you tend not to see microscopic, you know, micro photography on the walls of art museums. Why not? Yeah, you yeah, know, is it yeah. considered because there isn't a level of interpretation? You know, is that level of interpretation what takes something from being documentary to art? I mean, I think it is one thing. One thing. It yeah, can be. Yeah, yeah. When I first got a, a little um, microscope, I just remember obsessively looking at everything under it. Of course. It. Yeah. And just the f like, why can't that in itself be uh, art that's up on the gallery walls when people have their awareness, consciousness expanded to what something looks like at that small of a level? Sure. Then they get how things work sometimes. Well, I think, listen, I, I'm at this, at this stage in life now where I'm... I just don't care very much if something's called art or isn't, or as in a museum, or, or a, you know, it could be a squashed beer. It's all visually stimulating. I'm not, yeah. I'm not so interested in the labels or the, the systems built around these things. I'm much more interested, as we've been talking about, in a de-siloing on all levels. I love that and the de-siloing on all levels. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, and well, science has gone Western yeah. science has gone in this direction for obvious reasons, not for bad reasons of, of, of super specializing, you know, and it's not difficult to understand why, because for research purposes and so forth, it makes sense. But that's, you know, there's a kind of person whose personality and intellect lends itself to being super specialized. Mine is not that. You gave that example at the very beginning when you said uh, on the blueprint answer, you said some people are blueprinted just for that hyper special Seems. specialized one thing. Yeah. And other people are blueprinted to do very polymathic yeah. synthesis style work. Right. And yeah. Yeah. That's Maybe how the blueprint's more malleable. You know? Maybe, yeah. 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 yeah, or more, more modular, perhaps. Yeah, something yeah. like that. I like how you gave us the origin story of the first artist in residency program. So that was 2010, then. Yeah, that's 2010 is when I met Jill and went to the ATA the first time. Okay, and then from 2010, right after Carbon, what were the big, you know, your artist in residency projects? You know, because it kind of leads you into. Um, recipes for the mind slowly over time but take sure. us through these other fo f sure. the photographs well recipes episode. for the mind is is really looking at 35 years of experience in imaging but to answer your question yeah when i first came into the institute you know i was making it up as i went i mean at one it was just a it was a thrill and at first um i was intrigued by the access i got to nasa ames through the seti institute so i ended up doing three projects there 
One was, um, um, and all of these took permissions, and my great friend uh, Glenn Bugos, who was the historian at NASA Ames, was instrumental in developing access. But I, um, I did a sound work in the world's largest wind tunnel, the 80 by 120, and I really treated it as an acoustic space. And in that one, I was, I was amplifying um, sounds I'd recorded in one of the great rainforests in the world in Costa Rica, and then playing them back through amplifiers in this space, just really thinking um, about context and sound. So playing sounds from one of the most biodiverse places on Earth in one of the least biodiverse places. So that was a, it was a kind of experiment. It also became a kind of performative. I shot video of myself working in there, and that was fun. There was, um, as with a lot of my work, there was also some dry humor around it. And then I... Um, I got permission to uh, put several artworks in the fluid mechanics tanks at NASA Ames, and so those were the analog tanks where the early uh, space shuttle models were tested. And so that was very interesting because that was really, uh, you know, imaging, observing to image uh, the motion of fluids around artworks, which I thought metaphorically was pretty curious because we think about, you know, how do ideas flow around artworks? So I was playing with that. Um, and then I did a sound work, uh, which was called The Sound of a Quantum Computer Thinking, which was, um, I, I got permission, did audio recordings of the D-Wave 2 at NASA Ames, which is really the sound of v extremely high-end air conditioning. And, but but there's, a, there's a beat to it. And I measured the beat. It was 99 beats per minute. And it was it's really interesting. interesting. The, the engineers, when I asked them about that, they said, oh, yeah, that's the sound of the monkey running around inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a helium pump because the processor has to be uh, maintained at near absolute zero. But yeah. so there's a 99 beat per minute thump and then all these other sort of textural sounds. So that was really interesting. And then, so I was working on those things. And then at the same time, I started just casually meeting uh, scientists at the SETI Institute for lunch or coffee. I'd say, let's go and talk. And they were all very welcoming and all fascinating. And I really um, uh, just... Had, had a great rapport with Dr. Lawrence Doyle. So Lawrence is a polymath. He was one of the first scientists uh, working with e the idea of exoplanets before even looking for them. Now, of course, we know there's exoplanets around probably every star yeah. close to it. Yeah. So he was early on that. And But the, the science that Lawrence did, one, one, we really hit it off because Lawrence, um, you know, one of the hats he wears is as an information theorist. And he spent time with the Navajo, Navajo famously one of the most complex human languages. You know, they were the great, you know, you, active in code breaking in the Second World War. So Lawrence was interested in their language, but then also their, their thinking about nature. So he expressed that to me. And of course, that was very similar to my interests in Indonesia with the tribe I lived with. But then we were talking about, uh, you know, very aspects, various aspects of the science he was investigating. And he wrote the algorithms that proved that humpback whale communications exhibit syntax, very strongly inferring the whales have language. And in fact, now he has uh, excellent support from the Templeton Foundation. He's continuing that work along with other work. He's also working on um, quantum astronomy, which challenges ideas about the speed of light. Really front edge stuff. Also, just about the nicest man you could ever meet. So we That'd have be these, a great um, person to, to interview. Yeah, talk to. he would be That's great. Another one. And I'll tell you what. The first time I went, There's I had lunch so many with people him. like this. We went, you network. know, we went to an Indian restaurant. Yeah, I'm very fortunate. That way. <laughs> I went. We went to an Indian restaurant in Mountain View. You know, a buffet, and sat down. And we left five hours later. <laughs> Basically, they kicked us out. And I do a lot of audio recording. I didn't have an audio recorder that day. I totally kicked myself. So one of the things that was that was I mean, it was thrilling for me and, and exciting for both of us is it was very much a two-way conversation. Yeah. You know, we real, there was, you know, to have somebody like, Dor I'd say something Lawrence would say, I never thought of it that way. And that, you know, that was like, wow, yes, you know, there's yes, something yes. going on here. The tennis, the game of tennis is really important. It yeah. helps you get to novel. Exactly. Yeah. And so I never went and I never go to lunch again with Lawrence without bringing an audio recorder. <laughs> and, and I have a, a nice archive of, of those recordings. And I also kept some of the uh, paper uh, tablecloths because when Lawrence starts scribbling, that is like, you know, that's classic. Mm -hmm. That's classic stuff. Um, I should add that our, the archive for the SETI Artist in Residence program, what has now become a program, we've had 
15 artists go through, and we're about to name three more artists just a week from now. 15 have went through over 10 years. Yeah, nine. nine well, years. I'd say over seven nine. years because seven. I was okay. there the first couple. So about two or so a, uh, per year. Yeah, it's not Ish. so regular. But, okay. But yes. Okay. okay cool. So we're we're naming three, three in our next phase. Cool. But also, I was going to okay. say the um, the archive for our program is held um, at the Center for Art and Environment at Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, which is a great contemporary art museum and a leader in the territory where uh, contemporary art meets topics like climate change and biodiversity and so forth. So those uh those uh, tablecloth drawings and my recordings and are you know they're in that archive so they're actually there and researchable um is are the always um it's just so profound learning more about you know lawrence's work it kind of takes us all the way back to the interconnectedness and also it also you're giving all these examples of what the seti uh, artists and residences are doing i just w um, would like to hear a little bit um give us can you give us some of the cool uh f you know 15 of them in the last sure. seven years you said so like give us some of the epic mind-blowing well one uh, of the ones that was that was really surprising was uh, Martin Wilner is um, both an artist and a full-time psychiatrist. He's in New York. And the work he does is, you know, his art is just pencil on paper and his mind. So when I first thought what artists would be invited in, I, I, I was imagining it would be artists who were using technology, new media. That seemed obvious. That wasn't a lock, but I thought it was probably more like that rather than painting and, say, traditional mediums. So in fact, the first artist after me were a, a team of three roboticists from UC Santa Barbara. And they ended up working with John Jenkins, who was one of the principal investigators on Kepler. So the, the, the observatory, you know, the Off-Earth Observatory, uh, finding the exoplanets. And they did a great work, um, which was a robotic work uh, called Somnium, where they sonified uh, data uh, observations of exop real exoplanets. So that was very successful. But then Martin was one of the next ones, and he came in, and what he does is he basically uh, he interviewed uh, 12 scientists one month each. And so what happens is in his work, and he's done this with everybody from movie stars and rock musicians to sort of normal people, but what he did is he he worked with 12 scientists or 12 SETI Institute individuals and he um, exchanged information with them every day of a calendar month. So they would fax or call or text or email what they were thinking about or a question they had or a photograph or a song, anything. And then he basically does these illustrated calendars of every day of the week. But he developed these really intimate relationships with 12 of our scientists. So, so his work was very unexpected in that way. Um, you know, I hate to sort of single out one over another because we've had a, we've had a lot of yeah. great works. Um, more recently, um, uh, in fact, the most recent artist we named is uh, Zainab Al-Hashimi. So she is an Emirati woman from Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I saw her work at the Louvre Abu Dhabi mm. two years ago when I was over there for a conference and then happened through one of those beautiful uh, moments of serendipity to be sitting next to her at one of these grand banquets and we started speaking and wow. she was very interesting. And so uh, after the various protocols and so on and so forth that, that happened for an artist who's proposed to become an artist, she ended up pairing off with uh, Dr. Mark Showalter, who's one of the great living astroscientists of our time, who's named, I think, f more, more planetary bodies than any other living scientist, more than Galileo. Mark's awesome. Whoa. So they're actually working together. Uh, uh, Zainab's work has um, a, a strong interest in geometry. Mark's one of the world's experts on planetary rings, and they're wow. working on a... Um, uh, a sculpture, a kinetic sculpture for uh, Expo 2020 in Dubai next year. And that was, I mean, so, so that's wonderful. Yeah. They're working on a big project that's going to get a lot of play and visibility. But I have to say, when I first introduced them, and this is one of the, the joys and privileges of, of the position I'm in, they hit it off so quickly. And they're from different worlds, and boy, they were just right out of the gate they were exchanging ideas so that was a real pleasure and that's one of the things that happens is the 
artists are recommended in general through our, our uh, advisory committee, which is a very strong group of people um, with interest in arts and science. And so the artists get proposed and then they go through this, this you know, series of, of considerations. But, you know, at that moment when they come in and then it's this idea, well, this artist might work well with this scientist, let's see. And so they maybe go out for lunch or drinks or coffee or something and start to discuss. And so, you know, it, it gives the, the artists get an opportunity to, to, if nothing else, just sit down with a leading astro scientist and have a conversation. And then, you know, the, the similarly, the scientists are in general are not getting exposure to contemporary artists. So they get an opportunity to see, you know, to see the world through an artist's eyes in a sense. And, um, and so, the, so one is potential. It's, it's, it's exciting, but it's also it's been playing out in really in really nice ways. And in many ways, we're, we're just getting going. I mean, we're, you know, what we'd like to do, frankly, is to get the program endowed and, and yeah. carry on. Yeah. You know, we have a very strong relationship with uh, Lucas Arts at Montalvo, yeah. and they're one of our partners. And so they um, offer lodging and, and meals, but also a lot more because they're an established arts program. Um, Stanford's Electronic Music Lab, CCRMA, is one of our partners. The Long Now Foundation, San Francisco, is one of our Love partners. It. Yeah. So this is this network that, that both our artists and scientists get access to. So it's it's you know it's access to a world that that frankly a lot of, you know these artists probably wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, yeah. What they do with it is up to them. Yeah. Oh man, I love it. I love it. I love it. I just love it so much finding these really rock star artists from around the world, pairing them with rock star uh, astro scientists and just being able to storytell through all different types of mediums of art, just the profundity of what's actually yeah. going on. I love it. I would love for this conversation to act as like a flag so that we can remember that we need to feature more of the artists and residencies, right. that we need to feature more of these astro scientists as well. Sure. Uh, we got to do that. I mean, these people that you're listing just need more people to be aware of who they I are and more. what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and the ways that they're creating awakening inspirational sure. discoveries and content for the world sure. so i i'm just super in love I mean, with think, the program you know back to working with lawrence i mean the reason lawrence was asking about whales is because he simply said if we cannot communicate with advanced species <laughs> that share our own biochemistry on earth how the hell are we going to talk to et yeah. yeah and so then to you know just to bring artists in to think about different ways of approaching the unknown even if it's only symbolizing the unknown or symbolizing entering the unknown, there's, I mean, there, it, it, by definition, it's an enormous territory. Yeah, it's 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 potentially infinite. So that so the so the program's going well, and and uh, the institute's an exciting place to be. And and we have this big announcement coming up, November twenty first. Our next three. Yeah, artist. It's exciting. Can't leak it at the moment. So Sorry, pumped! So, so <laughs> pumped to hear about this. Um, and then also. Um, also, just thinking about it more, too, is like, oh, my goodness, how do we get more of, like you gave this example, this endowment of funding, right? How can you get, like, all of these multi, you know, billion dollar corporations or universities or governments from around the world? How do you just get the more than chump change uh, little charitable donations that people are giving you? We need the same thing. We're in the same boat here at Simulation. Well, I mean, thanks for bringing up. And for the record, our, our operational budget target is two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. It's so something like six change. million dollars yeah. would endow it. You know, so if there's somebody else there that would like to help, I yeah, can, I also yeah. cook. Uh, for, <laughs> I haven't washed the dishes at that level, but <laughs> but the potential is very interesting. I mean, I, really, it's more than interesting. It's it's yeah, compelling. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Because we have yes. these challenges at species level. We have these yes, challenges, yes, yes, and we yes. need to apply resources and imagination. And I think you know the nature of the nature of of research science and the nature of experimental art, which is what we're talking about, is you know the attrition rate's high. You know, you're, not every artist is going to hit a home run, just like scientists don't. Yeah, yeah. And so you need a you need a, tr a trust in and, and a support of the system that's, that's right. going to do that research. And I think of myself as a researcher. I mean, it's part of why I'm so comfortable at the yeah. institute. Yeah. All those scientists are research scientists. And I think of myself increasingly as a as an artist researcher. I love it. 
I mean, I call myself an explorer, and that's true, but it's, I'm really a researcher. It's what I'm most interested in. Yeah, yeah. It's not art as commerce. It's not, it's not that. Correct. It's something yeah. else. Yeah. It's uh, describing reality with art uh, and getting other people awakened and engaged to this reality that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And I, I love that, and it's such a cheap thing, like Two hundred sixty thousand dollars for something like this is like a no-brainer per year. It's a no-brainer. It's like yeah. how can we get way more funding for it? Um, and uh, like you said, the endowment. Like anyone that's you know that's tuning in that wants to pass along the right people into the SETI network to help fund this, please do. Um, this is a crucial one. Um, well, and I mean we're really interested in in also it's it, you know it's participatory. It, you know it's not just looking for a check. It's to have people with with minds and curiosity to come in and of course expand and and you know yeah. i mean we're expanding as we are but but the, the the room for expansion is 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 wonderful let's now um hit on some of these okay so we we did some of the um the the story of how the books of photographs came and now we're at the most recent book of photographs recipes for the mind right now Recipes for the Mind is very, um, it's super unique. Um, as you can see here, we're talking every single page looks like this. And what would you say is on the left and what is on the right? So this book it has 108 entries. There's 108 uh, uh, word clouds, poems, if you will, matched with photographs. And... Each of the, uh, the, the language came first, the written language came first. And I started uh, dreaming these uh, poems five years ago. So the, I told you about this Silva mind control, and I've been practicing lucid dreaming since I was about 16. And I keep mm -hmm. a, a low power headlamp and pen and paper next to bed. I have my whole life. So I wake up in the middle of the night, and I, with that light really low, I, I write down in a kind of pictographic language or words or pictures, you know, things from these dreams. And so the more you do it, the more you become aware of your dreaming. This is part of the lucid dreaming yes, practice. Yes, yes, yes. So in 2014, I was in Budapest and in St. Stephen's Cathedral. And in St. Stephen's Cathedral is St. Stephen's hand from a thousand years ago. Supposedly that hand committed a miracle and so and the supposedly the hand never disintegrated when he passed away and so it was kept in a gold reliquary as it is now and that reliquary was taken when the turks you know sacked budapest and it was taken by the nazis and it kept coming back so i thought this was kind of you know humorous and bizarre and you pay a little bit extra money you put like i don't know what it is it's not a euro something like that in a box and the light comes on inside this reliquary that lights up St. Stephen's hand. It's all bizarre, kind of wonderfully bizarre. Anyway, I had a dream about that, and, and, it, and it led to the, sort of the precursor of, of the texts that are in Recipes for the Mind. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was, was how it related to food, and I basically programmed myself in the lucid dreams. I mean, you can learn to sort of program the topics or the geographies you're going to explore in lucid dreams once you get at a proficient level. And, um, and so I, I set it to work mining basically food experiences, conversations over meals, mm -hmm. things that happened around, some of it was hunting because I was around those hunters as a photojournalist. And my subconscious started spitting these things out and I was writing them down. And over the course of about four years, they started to add up to a group. So I started to mock up a book. I mean, that's something I've been doing my whole life. And um, originally I thought I would use some of my drawings paired with the words and then a publisher, David Rothenberg, who's a great musician and has this publishing imprint, you know, saw this work in the studio and was interested and, and basically encouraged me to put together a book with photographs. So then I started going back into both my physical film archive, my Kodachromes from all those travels, all those decades, and then all the way right up through iPhone photos to very recently. So I picked, um, after a long and, and very emotional um, deep dive into my archives, because you know, you're know you diving into film archives, you're diving into memory. I mean, these are 
These are memory triggers. Yeah. So that was a whole sort of story in itself. Anyway, I, I eventually I edited down to 108 images that matched the 108 texts. And, um, and so I had that group of photos ready to go for the book. And it was about a month before deadline. And they were, in a sense, straight photographs. The, the rectangle was clean. And I just felt that I, I, they weren't expressing this relationship to memory as, as in the way that I wanted. They were too of a known format. They just weren't doing it. And I had a, um, a, you know, and I was thinking a lot about the nature of memory because I would find that a memory from 30 years ago had that, you know, that word again, the veracity of a memory from two days ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, curious stuff, you know? Yeah. And so I happened to take one of these prints that was sitting there on, on my flatbed scanner, and I was scanning it for some purpose, and something happened, and I bumped the scanner. Perfect. And the image bent. Wow. And, you know, I've been thinking about this idea of bending time, you know, yes. f the fabric of time, space, all these things. So, I'm, I mean, the idea of bending is very interesting yes, anyway. Yes. And aesthetically, I found the image quite compelling. I mean, it has some of that look of uh, if you put a magnet near a television or something like that. Yeah. So, it worked conceptually. Aesthetically, I liked it. And I went to work, and I took all 108 photos, and I basically processed them on the flatbed scanner. So, I took the... You know, you think about the photograph. The photograph comes from a real place and a real incident, and it's captured on analog film or digital. doesn't matter. And then it's printed. I have a hard print. And then I scan it, and I manipulate the print during the scan. It becomes a digital file. Then it gets printed again and becomes an analog. So there's all these levels of processing, and these levels of processing are, have always been interesting to me. I do it a lot when I work with sound, is this processing, filtering, bending, stretching, you know, stretching the medium. And ultimately, at the end of it, I, just, I found the group, for me personally, more compelling as a group of pictures. Obviously, I'm, mm -hmm. I've been around photography my whole life. I think about it a lot. I think about imaging. I think about seeing. And so, you know, there's that book. And, uh, yeah, my editor and buddy David Rothenberg loved it. He has an arrangement, new arrangement with MIT Press. They're distributing. They really liked it. Excellent. We ran a Kickstarter campaign to uh, fund it. We got 300% on that. Boom. And we went away. And so, you know, we're, we're like, uh, yeah, thank you. Great. I love it. Yeah, really satisfying. And the book, I mean, the, 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 I mean poetry is a very raw medium. You know, it's a very interesting thing to express oneself. I hadn't before. I mean, I've written lots. My books would have certainly forwards and afterwards. And so now, you know, I have this, this, this raw content. So I'm, as I told you earlier, I'm developing a, a podcast, a Recipes for the Mind podcast around this. So there will be 108 short episodes. Mm. And in it, I'll, I'll, I'll read the, the, you know, one of the word clouds, one of the poems, and I'll talk about the incidents and ideas yeah. behind it. Yeah, great. You know, short, yes, yes. short clips. So that's, I mean, that's coming very soon. I like that a lot, yeah. yeah. So for, this is, I mean, yeah, it's my first book one. of, of yeah. poetry, and, and what an interesting way to express oneself. Exactly, yeah. Well, what a cool story, too, about just even just hitting the photocopier and then having it just... Yeah, uh, yeah. Just and add playing that. with it. Yeah, and playing with it. I mean, you're... It's so cool. You know, not to put too fine a point on it, but you're, you're literally playing with memory. Exactly. And, yeah. the, and to have it so crystal clear and perfect is like, you know, there is that tiny bit of distortion. Sure. Uh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's and really most of them, unique. you know, one of the things I did with that, it was, it was very much like improvisational music in that when I took the print and then put it on the flatbed scanner, I usually got the processed image the first or second shot. So I'm not somebody that would be, you know, working each image 30 times. The spontaneous results were the, were the, were the things that, that felt the best. And so the other thing it did is I'm taking images from 35 years of photography, different film stock, different digital base. And it, I, I felt that, you know, they became a coherent group through this kind of processing as well. You know, they became of one body of work. Well, I mean, that's the hope. Listen, you know, I'm an artist. I do this thing. You know, you put it out in the world and see if it flies. Let's let's dive into to some. Great. Yeah. If you feel like it, would you like to share one? 
that can comes, I read? Can I read something? Please read somewhat random. Read something, and then let us know if a uh, if there is a a correlating image available on your website or. Um, and what is well okay so i'm just i am really um you can flash all the, except for a couple this would be you can flash the image to this i'm going to start with here. this one and what is that one called it's called uh upside down trout and this will be the first time i've ever read this uh, in public so upside down trout fracking viewed from thirty nine thousand feet over wyoming eating cashews reading about china topping typing on iphone about fracking and freedom and myths. Bloated beast sits on toilet, character in cage next to Oval Office, tweeting treason, the inane, the anti-wisdom, the end. Window seat, what became interesting after enough became enough. Ping pong wontons, sympathetic sauerkraut, nano noodles, look down, limbs amok, falling up on a stick by a stream over fire, Head down, salt covered, upside down trout democracy. Well, most of that is somewhat obvious. I mean, it's me looking out the window of an airplane. I fly a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Some of it's about a bloated beast in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and the upside down trout is when I was in Japan, actually, with those hunters. Uh, they would catch trout, and they covered them in salt. Uh, they got them, and they put them head down on a stick on a willow that they soak. And then they get a, a bed of coals, a little fire by the riverside, and so then they stick the stick in the middle of the coals, and the heat obviously goes up, and you get this beautiful sort of campfire baked salted trout, very Japanese. And if you have lemon, you squeeze some lemon on it, and mm. it's it's great. So I'm also an avid trout fisherman, a fly fisherman. So um, I love the way that you um, have a completely different. Uh, a grammar that like that's poetry it's a word cloud like you said but it's just it's totally not like our classical uh descri- sentences and and the well it has its own it has its own cadence it's, its own, own cadence purpose. i love it its own yeah. purpose i love it I, think, I love that it's I mean, unique I think, listen the tools that in, in this way it's words but uh, these tools as an artist it's sort of the the right tools for the right purpose and so it's you know but i, I think one of the things that i like that I have the idea because I'm just expressing it and it's brand new with you tonight, is I'd like the opportunity to read them because when you hear me speak the words, I mean, you, maybe, maybe the listener gets a better you know, sense of what I'm doing. Which will you'll have for all 108 of these um, yeah. down the line. That's going to be really exciting. That's going to be on charleslindsay.com. That's, yeah, actually, it's going to be on recipesforthemind.com. Recipesforthemind.com. But they'll cool. link. But they'll link. Okay, May I read another one of randomly? Of course, please, yes. So this is a picture... Um, I'll show this, this one. This, this camera. camera. Uh-huh. This is um, the source image is a buddy of mine, Wu Juhe, is a great Chinese artist. And I'll, we'll maybe talk a little bit about China in a bit. Okay. But uh, this one is called um, Psychoactive Blue Cheese. <laughs> so, post gringo motion tracker, beta chip set, level one. Access enter, new species, blue cheese. Mutated, psychoactive. Affords visions of one possible future. More eating, more futures, intertwined. Some don't come back. Full cranial firmware update, the great recalibration. An unprotected thought, hurtling forward, naive to the forest of symbiotic acquaintances, patiently voracious. Intellectual calories they despise, suddenly, disguising as cheese corn, hovering in space. Our thoughts are neither particle nor wave, but conjured that cheesy chemical smell. Apologies. So. <laughs> I have no idea what this sounds like to anybody but myself. I'm still yeah, figuring yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the nature of the game. Yes. So. Whoa. Would you like more? Yes. Give us another one. Okay. This is. Uh, yeah, great. Okay, so this mm-hmm. is um, at, a, at hey, friends of mine's farm. Cannabis. Yeah, that's a beautiful flower. That's a mm-hmm. Jamaican dream. And that's uh, grown by friends of mine at Moongazer Farms in Mendocino. Um, Taste Buds is the name of ah, this work. Okay. Asperger's, Oddballs, Supposed Geniuses, Short Films, Cooking Shows, 
request operations so we don't desire fine wines, high fidelity music, endless water, boundless freedom, taste buds, gravity. Smells like art, somewhat familiar, biodegradable, elevates cholesterol, stimulates my pancreas, feeds my mind, requires antacid. Stardust, mutations, nonsense, absurdity, humility, teeters precariously along a precipice that isn't there. Moongazer farm, space monkey, Jamaican dream, sun-grown biodynamic, terpenes, cannabinoids, polypharmaceuticals, happy, legal, finally. So. <laughs> I could go on. There's a lot yes, of them. Yes, yes, yes. It's also, um, you know, just again, just like the way that you like storytell via the word clouds is really cool. And in addition to the way that you designed the the photo that you kept, these photos have been captured over 35 years. You took yeah. a while picking these, um, having the word clouds that come with them. It's it's a really interesting. Um, it's a f I think it's a really cool future of uh, of storytelling where it's a, it's a unique. It's very unique. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it and it really is the 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 language of my subconscious. Yeah. I mean, the way that these things came out is how my subconscious spit them out. I mean, there's very little post editing, you know. So that I mean, that's one of the the. Mar I mean, we talk about outer space, but inner space. You know, our 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 consciousness. Our let's talk about dream time. You know, that's that's where I'm also, I'm amazed. So those things would come out, and I would capture them, and they appear pretty close to how they came out. Sometimes they were longer, and I'd cut them down mm -hmm, a little. Mm -hmm. But so even me, is it's sort of, you know, it is sort of like somebody I don't know is speaking from somewhere in between my ears, if in fact that's where that voice is coming from. But so, th so there, there, there is a true rawness to it. And so I, you know, I just chose to, to expose them like that, you know, for better or worse. Yeah, yeah. It's also really interesting now seeing this as something that um, can contemplate so many of the it, the things that we that we mentioned initially at the beginning of the episode. This list of things, you know, art, tech, consumption, near death experiences, wildlife, psychedelics, time travel, failure, courage, AI, and they're all in like you said trans temporal spaces i think that's so fascinating and it's again it's just a very unique way of being able to synthesize so many different fields into word clouds accompanied by photos um that have a unique t taste to them um like this is really cool and it's all available so the um the the book is available to order you can find that link in the bio below um that uh check out that link um go ahead and order the book the it's the amazon link that's in the bio below and recipesforthemind.com will soon have all of you reading it in your cadence yeah my my, my intention is to release one a week for 108 weeks it's you know it's Great. a little over two, two years. years so I'm, yeah. I'm gearing up for that and then there may be That's some cool. other um probably it will be, be some other interviews that's what i was gonna like say that. so someone else can hit the tennis ball back about what they think yeah absolutely yeah, yeah i mean yeah, it'll start cool. to get its it'll hopefully start to get its own life and momentum yeah. definitely yeah. Yeah. Now, teach us about um, field station. So um, this is already up to the fourth field station. So I just, as, as we're sitting here uh, tonight in November, um, the fourth iteration of field station just opened at the Beach Museum at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, the first one was at Mass Mocha in Massachusetts, great contemporary museum. Second one was at the Des Moines Art Center. Third was at the Akron Museum. And then the fourth is at the Beach Museum. And I've shown some individual pieces uh, uh, separately. But the field station is referencing the field stations that I worked in as a young geologist, and then biologic field stations in rainforest. And um, so I always love the aesthetic of these mobile research stations, whether they're, they're tents or you know sometimes they're, they're containers that are dropped by helicopter. And, and what's happening in, those, in, in there is the, the larger structure is created by these cases that I salvaged on eBay. I, a lot of the components for my artworks, the physical artworks, I find on eBay. For example, I found a missile guidance system for sale on eBay a few years ago, which I bought and sort of Frankensteined <laughs> into an artwork. But the cases I found, um, and they were used in the... Um, 
uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars to take replacement transfer cases for Humvees that had been hit by roadside bombs. So they were replacement parts for the transmission, the underside. Wow. And the cases were used, and then, you know, probably once, and then they were um, sold off as salvage. So I bought a couple of them and started building artworks, and then I went back to the man that had them near Boston and said, do you have more? And he sort of said, you know, son, I've got a lot more. (laughs) And so then I went to his warehouse, and all these cases, you know, they were stacked high, and I realized that in numbers they could become architecture. So I bought... I don't know, I have like 150 of them. And so I build artworks in them. But then, you know, they were built to stack on aircraft carriers and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. So then I, so then I have this, this walls and it's modular. And so, um, you know, so I'm creating these, these field stations, but they're my artistic research field stations, which are synthesizing ideas about science and magic and absurdity. And so the piece you're looking at there has rare fluorescent mineral samples that I collected in Greenland a few years ago. And they're in a chromatography column. That's a device used in the biotech industry to Mm -hmm. put uh, drugs with pathogens for tests. And so I salvaged one of those and then uh, put in this custom UV lighting for the rocks. And and, and it actually has a sound component as well. Wow. Um, So... You know, so these are things where they're, they are devices and they're artworks. I mean, they're only art. There's nothing else to call them, really. Um, and so the, 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 the show moves, the, the format of what are the walls, the structure changes, the pieces in it change it. Um, but but this, is, this is this mode that I'm showing in at the moment. So unique. Again, just like this idea that these... <laughs> these uh, military grade uh, units for transporta- transporting things can be repurposed um, by an, uh, an artist that wants to synthesize complex, uh, like inspirational scientific uh, um, artistic content inside of them uh, and then tell a story that, uh, and now- So one of, one yeah, of the pieces ahead. sort of like the, if you see the blue and red, yeah. one of those, yeah, so- uh-huh. This, this field station, I have two pieces that, um, among other th- things, utilize a real Tibetan antique. So that is a 15th century painted panel from a monastery in Tibet, which I acquired Whoa. from a Slovakian climber. And then one of the other ones has a 19th century bronze. So one, I, I'm a great fan of um, and collect a little bit um, ancient art, and I love the Tibetan art. And I also love the, the symbolism of the deities in it. And in this instance, the, that painted panel is in with um, a group of seven uh, gold-leafed horseshoe crabs. And underneath wow. there's a, a programmed LED lighting, which mimics the crabs signaling. And the, the lighting is programmed so that you have something like a visual song it's 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 one it's thinking about synesthesia so you're seeing music so what happens is it's is it's coded so that we have um, an initial pulse a beat then a melody is created and then it complicates and then uh, develops in the way that a short song develops and it's randomized so it's different every time so it runs somewhere between th- uh, 30 and 2 minutes and I have, there's a couple friends of mine that help with the coding. I'm not a coder. But when you, when you look at this thing, you can feel that, that perhaps these, these crabs are communicating. But the, the Tibetan panel is a bit of a non sequitur in that device. So these are, these are devices. It's, again, it's just so unique. Well, I'm so curious what the first three were. Well, they're all they're the three, three field stations. Yeah. I mean, they're different works, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that was that was funny was we, um, for all the works that you saw, um, those bear hunters I told you about as a parting gift uh, when I was up there that, that spring with them, and that was in the 90s, um, they gave me a bear's penis <laughs> as a gift. Did you keep and it? And a bear's penis Stop looks it? a lot like, you know, a piece of beef jerky with a bit of rope on the end, and, then this, and then this old... Japanese writing and it was in a Ziploc bag so if that isn't weird enough <laughs> so but, weird. I mean they had a sense of humor but That's they said weird. listen this thing is you know they basically said you know all speaking Japanese of course they said you know this thing is valuable so when you travel if you go to Hong Kong sell it and take the money and 
you know, use the money to do your work. And so I took the the bear's penis in the Ziploc bag with the with the Japanese writing. What a story! <laughs> and went in one of those, um, you know, animal, you know, medicine shops in Hong Kong, and they basically laughed me out the door because they obviously thought this. Did they play a joke on you, Dude. the Japanese? No, I don't no. think so. They actually, anyway, so I still had that. That's funny. It does actually loop back. So in the you were like, I'm supposed to get ten thousand dollars for this exactly. bear penis. I think it was about three, but anyway. <laughs> But so when I when I do these field stations, I mean, one of my ideas about showing art these days is that I don't like to preload the idea. I don't I don't want to board in front of the show telling what the viewer what to see, what to think, what to feel. I think that the, the greatest gift I can offer the viewers is that they might see something they've never seen before or touch or smell or something like that. And so usually in these shows, when there is that board, I mean, sometimes if there's a little explanatory text, I like it after the, sh- after the, the flow of the show. So, so if somebody wants to read after, they can. But I don't want to front load. I want people to go in and go, what the hell is going on here? That's what I want. So, you know, in that list, I, I often just, uh, on, the, on the, the details of the show, it just lists the components. And I think it's quite interesting to say, like, yeah. Fiber optic cable, laser parts, Tibetan panel, bear's penis. So in the first one, we actually, the bear's penis was in one of the cases. So nobody could see the bear's penis. But you could see who was like really paying attention because <laughs> people go in and there were a lot of things yeah, to yeah, look yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were a certain number of people that would happen it, if I wasn't there with the curators. I was there and they'd come up and go, where's the bear's penis? penis. Yeah, exactly. And it was really we interesting how that worked. So it was almost like the idea of what yeah. wasn't seen yes, yes, was yes. every bit as important as what was. It's yeah, not like yeah, that's a new yeah, revelation. Yeah. But I've been playing with that a lot. That's cool too. That's you a know, good one too. It's very yeah. curious. Yeah. But I think also yeah. I was... Um, I was um, doing some work at Bell Labs for a bit. I was around the scientists there. And there was an a Iranian scientist, an amazing young man, doing uh, work with haptics, so touch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they were basically hooking people up to fMRI and then doing all kinds of tests. And, and, and the way it related is I, I had mentioned to him, I actually mentioned to one of the other scientists who then introduced me, that I really want, uh, I want viewers touching my art. Yeah. You know, and that, that whole museum idea of don't touch the art. Yes, I mean, yes. if, it's a, if it's an important painting, you get why you shouldn't touch it. But my objects, I don't mind, and they're totally robust yeah. in general. And so I met this man, and, he, and I, I told him this, and he said, you absolutely want viewers touching your art. And he's sort of like, come here, check this out. And he showed me his research. And the difference between... You know, a connection between any person and it can be an inanimate object or another person. The difference between touching and not wow. is, is profound. Yeah. You'll remember when you touch more. Yeah, when we touch. And, and you know, how, depending on cultures, we touch when we speak to people oh, and so on, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but even like an object, it just, you know, when, when you touch something, you, your cortex is going red. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, these ideas are playing into the Very field station. Interesting. You know, some museums it's difficult because the... It hones the your, it hones your um, focus. Exactly. More. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So these, you know, all the... And th- so this is literally something that it, that's come out of mine being, you know, my experience in a laboratory and learning these things and then bringing them into these, you know, as, as the field station ideas developed. This is a huge point is uh, when you're trying to um, <clears throat> awaken, uh, inspire, communicate something, uh, to have something that's physical and tangible um, as yeah. well, or olfactory, smell. Um, I love that. Um, well, and I, did, I mean, it's, yeah. very, it's very simple stuff, but sometimes, you know, you walk into my, these spaces and it looks like a lab, but sometimes I've, I've worked with like, um, you know, pine sap that I'm gathering when I'm hiking in the Rockies and then have just simply heated. So you see a laboratory, but you smell a pine tree, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and the other thing, the thing I'm doing is I'm not, you know, I'm not pushing any idea. I don't, I don't want you or anybody else to think what I think or feel what I think. I just want you to have an experience. And so, you know, this playing with the senses this way is very interesting to me. And, I, yes, and ultimately, yes. I mean, I'm doing, it, I'm doing it in a very lo-fi manner. And some of that's budget. Some of that's immediacy. Uh, I mean, sound's an incredible, as we all know. But, it, I mean, sound's an incredible medium to work with. And I think that was when the digital revolution sort of blossomed. Sound was, for me, was, a, was something. Because all of a sudden, you know, you could do on the laptop what used to take 
tape and I mean I'm not that old but yeah, still yeah. there was that break where all of a sudden you know with in software you could just do incredible things with mangling and processing and spatializing and filtering all those things we can do with sound and then I also you know I really I, I mean I was audio recording early but but now although I'm an avid I'm still an avid photographer with my iPhone but I love the process of audio recording because, again, that's a process of focus. Yeah. I mean, you know that. Yeah. When you're yeah. recording, you're paying attention. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This also is <clears throat> starting to <clears throat> inspire me because um, when you can add, you know, U.S. memory champions, world memory champions have been doing this for the longest time. But when you can add in multiple senses into the way that you complexly try and remember something and store it, you're way more likely to commit it to memory and then be able to recall it later. Sure. So you're not just thinking of a normal desert, but you're thinking of like a purple desert that is the size of Jupiter that also smells like grapes. And right. then all of a sudden you're way more likely to remember that. Sure. And then you can recall it later. So if you add that to your kind of like, you know, pitch that when you're pitching someone something or um, when you're trying to give a talk or right. um, just these are really important things to do. And so when, as an artist, when you're trying to communicate something so profound to people, let them touch it, create some sort of a scent, um, uh, really get people engaged with it. And then all of a sudden people will walk away and they'll remember it. And th that's really what, you know, that what we want to help do with these shows as well is we want to help create things that that help people remember the profound things that people like you are teaching on the yeah. program yeah. so you know that may be something like you know having something really simple like just parsing every single episode for the most key points and making a little you know five minute reel on charles Lindsay's uh, debut on simulation and having people be able to watch that or having people see every profound thing that you're teaching in a knowledge graph and be able to click into that and see the different things that we were talking about that were most profound so different ways for people to learn um the, the content as well this is super important for anyone that's trying to um, help inspire and awaken through content um and okay so now um i feel like boom like we covered a solid amount yeah. of do you feel good about can we get to some of the end questions or do you feel go like for some, it yeah do you feel like i we, mean listen there's so much there's so much to talk about yeah. i know so yeah. um but just give us some an, another hint on um the you know f so things like field station as well as things like what the artists and residencies um what they're doing um they have it you know, these are able to be um, expressed sometimes through like gallery debuts, sometimes through digital um, uh, uh, dissemination, and they're all available on on SETI for people to go and like. Yeah, look sure. At. If you go on the on the SETI site and look at the artist, you can click on their links and see what they're doing. And um, yeah, it's that's all there. One and one of the things that I would say, which is which is very much a projection of my interests. But is, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in things that are ephemeral. And I'm interested in the arts that are ephemeral. I mean, I love theater and I love live music. And, and in, a, in a, I mean, this is my theory, but, you know, in, a, in, a, in this capitalist society we're in, so much of art is thought not only is the thing that sells and what price it is, but it's like it's the saleable object. And, and that's fine, and there's lots of great objects in the world, but I'm really interested in the ephemeral. I'm interested in these, yeah. in these experiences. And so, you know, we're also looking to um, artists that are, that are working in, just call it different mediums. Yeah. You know, so I think over time, we'll, we'll span the, the possibilities of, of, of those mediums. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm also very interested in that as well. And that's why, you know, when you have something like this beautiful capture um, that can be as long as 35 years ago, can you somehow, you know, that, that used to maybe not be um, so recalled um, at one point, can you also like sometimes why do these things recall so well in our memory um, as well? And how can you then further um, disseminate that? I'm just I'm a big fan of that as well. And there's just certain things that why are why what do you remember at the end of the year? What do you remember at the end of a 10 year period? Sure. What do you remember at the end of your life? And like, how can you take those things and make them really uh, at the at the most the salient part of your being and you, what you care about if you're not doing that then like 
you know, if the thing that you remember from that last year isn't something that's your uniquely blueprinted for as as your gift that you're bringing to the world, then what is it that's going on? That's you know, this is more on the like we can get deeper into this because this is kind of in the some of the next questions, but because is it really you know, is it the economic machinery that's pressuring you into doing things that you're not actually blueprinted for, and that would could lead us into these these questions? Well, the culture. I mean, this is you know, this is the you know, the goldfish can't you know, see itself for the bowl or the trees for the forest. I mean, we live, you know, the American culture is, you know, it's, it's justified by its own existence. And it's, it's not like there aren't people pushing at it and, and looking at it and questioning it. Of course there are. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you know, maybe democracy is part of that in this culture, but it's, but it's very powerful and very consuming. You know, it is the dominant culture on earth is the, is American capitalism. And, you know, I've seen that because particularly, you know, from the other end, when I was going out to those peripheries, you know, cultural peripheries where you see, you know, and, and, you know, in the 80s, you still had to work hard to go out to places that were not affected by consumerism or advertising or, or American ideas. You know, the American system is just one system. And I think that it, it you know, it is only natural that this hyper capitalistic systems art in general would be that i mean how could it be anything else but i think it's you know it's wonderful and probably mandatory and beautiful to look look at art or to attempt to look at things in other ways yeah you know i mean why you know this is this you know, on the one hand, we're very interested in, in multiculturalism, but at the same time, we have to know that the world is culturally homogenizing. So, yeah, yeah diversity is interesting. Diversity of viewpoints, diver- yeah. all kinds yeah. of diversity. Yeah, Biodiver- all kinds of diversity are, are, it seems to me, valuable and, and the way to go. But so many of our, yeah. you know, the, the, men- the momentum is such that uh, homogenization is, is more what's happening. That could be imaging. I mean, one of my mm-hmm. thoughts, you know, working on recipes for the mind was, you know, we all know we live in this glut of imaging. If you're a professional photographer, and it's, I, I mean, uh, you know, what sets a photographer apart in this time when everybody's photographing? I mean, that's the challenge to somebody yeah. that would call themselves a certain kind of photographer, yeah. maybe an art photographer. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, something so deeply um, that resonates with us about uh, just seeing the world all as our uh, beautiful collective project that we're working on. And at the same time, there's these different like permutations of cultures that are their own little combinatorics of how they govern, how they have run an economy, how they um, how, what they do about spirituality and psychology and um, and how they advance technology and science. Like it's just very, very different ways also of living and, and being and all the way to um, indigenous people. And like we were talking about with animism at the very beginning as well, just completely different combinatorics of, of living um, versus metropolises. Um, do you feel like we have free will or is this all determined? I don't know. That's such a rabbit hole. Yeah. I think like most things, it's, it's not binary. It's all the above. Mm. I think it's some combination. Mm. Like if you're more aware of your own interconnectedness to all plus your own unique blueprint that you have more free will and maybe if you're more just like you know falling into the economic machinery and falling into the 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 dopamine monkey era of of getting the information to you then maybe you're more determined i just think it's i mean i'm again it's like i can only know it from myself i can imagine perhaps in others but it's it's just non-linear i mean i think there are times and situations where we're, we're just the damn monkey and maybe there's times when something else is going on mm. yeah I, th- I just i think it's it's a full spectrum i don't think it's any one thing interesting yeah okay i think there's glimpses of free will but yeah okay and what maybe we, that's you, my microbiome you, you gave the monkey um on one side what's the glimpse of the free will on the other side well this is totally thinking on my feet but those moments when when improvising in music um, 
for improvising and making art or improvisation of any nature yeah. that that i mean i'm totally thinking on my feet but i think that's part of that's that joy and that's that excitement is that it it, it feels like a new flower blossoming not like the repetition of an existing flower but i don't know that's tricky yeah and then do you think that there is a global ruling elite of humans yes global, um, well i suppose there is but i don't think it's as organized as that language suggests who do you think they are well they hide behind corporations don't they they yeah a global ruling elite yeah temporary mm-hmm very temporary yeah the decentralization era the yeah. psychedelics era the interconnected era all kicking that uh that yeah. ruling elite power out of its stranglehold yeah yeah tough question um i mean it's very conspiracy theory ish but i mean they say like in hong kong there's basically six families you know, six very wealthy families control the place, and that's one of the reasons things are boiling right now. But we're not anyway. We're not going to go down politics. We don't need to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's some of the crazy stuff that you described. When a couple families just own all of the means of production, and I mean, you're going to experience a turmoil. Like, well, no, you're not necessarily if those. If those rulers were benevolent rulers, if they practiced the altruism. But why sure. even that? Just distribute the fruits and let people express their unique blueprints in a more decentralized way. It doesn't have to be, oh, cool, we have 2,000 billionaires on the planet, and let's just make more of them altruistic. It's like, no, did you really have to stomp on people's throats along the way to get money? So anyway, this is another yeah, rabbit hole thing. But Yeah, and yeah, it's, not, yeah. It's, not really, it's not like I'm not paying attention, but it's also not yeah. my territory of interest. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit defeatist. Yeah, um, yeah. There's better. We're building the next world, and that those the architecting those protocols uh, to maximize flourishing is the most important yeah. thing to focus on. So let me tell you something um, more. Well, positive. I mean, you, you can do what you want with the background, but uh, one of the things that's been exciting for me the last three years is I've been um, working in China quite a bit, showing, speaking, traveling. It's all interconnected, and. Um, you know, there's a real interest there in this uh, art tech, what's called new media territory that I'm working in. But the other thing that's, that's happened for me is that, you know, I have this interest in ancient history. And I got interested through a jade idol I bought on eBay that looked like E.T., which I then found out was attributed to the Hongshan culture from seven, nine thousand years ago, which for all the world, you know, it looks like a, a, an E.T. idol. But I got interested in, in, in probing the archaeology of this culture through new media, through this tech art. And I worked with a Chinese artist on, on the first big museum show we did where we built a wind tunnel in a contemporary art museum and created basically as much wind as we could with uh, our budget and machinery. But we built seven in custom industrialized fans that had sensors recognizing the viewer. And so they, you know, the, the, the wind was the medium, and then we had anemometers in the space, so real-time wind data in the museum was affecting uh, projected uh, photogrammet f photogrammetry from these archaeological digs. This, yes. Yeah, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but one of, the, one of the thrills was, I think, that one, um, you know, Chinese are, in general, are very educated, uh, particularly compared to Americans. And they have a real interest and pride in their in their deep history, and so the fact that we were working with ideas about about ancient history in a contemporary manner led to opportunities to visit uh, digs and archaeological sites and historic locations, and um, and so that's been thrilling. That's very much ongoing, and I and and you know, you know, sort of branching off from there, but but in the realm what we're discussing. You know, China's having this this heyday of science fiction writing. A number of the of the you know, the award winning novels last few years in the West have been Chinese science fiction writers, and so it's um, it's it's been a really interesting place to work. 
And so, I mean, one of the things that speaks to is, is sort of where and when is the climate optimal for certain kinds of art. And I would say, you know, right now for me, China is the most exciting place mm. and it's eager and it's more of a, I would say it's more of a, an idea frontier than the West right now. Also, things happen quickly. Shows that would take two or three years planning in the West can happen in two or three or four months. And so it can be a bit hairy, but the energy around it's, you know, really intense and focused. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm very impressed by the Chinese contemporary artist as a, that's a big generalization. And I've been lucky enough that I'm, I'm, you know, I've been around sort of the cream of the crop. And in general, they're half my age or younger. But that's a whole, that's a whole nother aspect of thinking, you know, where does, where does culture flourish? And, 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 you know, where ideas welcome. So for all the, the larger politics, I mean, what big country isn't problematic? You know, there, there is some very interesting stuff going on. Yeah, I love how focused you were in that last bit on the importance of what China's doing in the world. We just also, like we bonded on, came back from those partnership interviews in Beijing, Hangzhou, and Shanghai. And it, it's just profoundly important for us to be more aware about what's going on in their own combinatorics, their own <coughs> beautiful expression as well, um, and try and identify what could be some of the things, um, in a sense, like we were talking about marrying science and spirit or science and art. Um, it's kind of like marrying the East and the West in many ways. Um, for a prosperous tree that's growing out of this egg yolk that's yeah. that we're all birthing from. What I you think you know in these times mm -hmm. more than ever. You know, speaking to that, you know, when I'm over there, I'm 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 an ambassador. You know, I feel like I'm an ambassador for for. I hope for the best that our you know some of the best of what our culture offers. I mean, I'm a for all the the for all the challenges the Bay Area has. I mean, the aggregation of minds and in 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 the Bay Area and the things that are being discussed, whether it's the front of social media or psychedelics or, or organic biodynamic farming. I mean, the Bay Area is, it's happening. And so then a lot of those ideas, you know, to, to take those ideas and, and, and interact and mesh with, you know, our Chinese, I, as I say, artists, you know, our compatriots, you know, I, it's, it's, you know, I'm, 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 I'm the anti-DC ambassador over there. And I think it's really important. And I'm not the only one thinking that. I mean, the arts is a very good way to interact with other cultures. Yeah, a very absolutely. Good way. That's a great point. And um, I'm just loving this um, last bit on, on that because there's so many different combinatorics of art that's happening around the world. And it is a great way to engage with people geopolitically. I love that. Um, you know, tomorrow night, um, mm -hmm. Gray Area in San Francisco, who I'm a big fan of, or... Um, the, the evening show is electronic musicians from Shanghai. Mm. The early show is Morton Sabotnik. I mean, they have a hot night going on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But that's a place that's doing exactly that. You know, they're bringing over these, yeah, these yeah. artists. Yeah. yeah. What do you think is a skill that we should know moving into this next world? Well, you mean, is it coding? I think the skill is one-on-one um, is -on -one human interaction i don't think we can ever get good enough at that so you know again i'm it's just not my position i don't know enough i don't have kids to be look you know it's it's you read a lot of stuff that's that's quite cynical about people you know falling into screen world and vr world but i think yeah i think one-on-one -on -one human interaction there there's i mean i'm a knucklehead for me that's that's an ongoing lifetime Likewise. Effort. And it's, Likewise, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm I don't know if I'm going to graduate effort. by the end of the game. Or enlightenment as well. Like, how deeply can you stay interconnected to everything all the time? You know, it's another one. And um, But this kind of also interestingly leads into the next question, which is, do you think that humans are a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence? Could be. I'm a big fan of sci-fi, and, and I don't see why not. You know, so, okay, so I'm going to take that and... and, and sort of pose a question to you that's something I, I think about, and that is if we might imagine that religion was necessary at a certain stage of human evolution, by definition, and if we look, you know, art has been, necess has been necessary, it has been with us for a great part of our evolution. But if we, in the post, if, if we might imagine a post-biologic us, 
some hybrid and then maybe a completely non-biologic. And if we imagine that the systems that run that uh, coded systems, call it machine learning, call it AI at a certain level, if it evolves towards super logic, and by the way, this idea is already basically posited in the character of Spock, if that, if that evolves to a position of super logic, is art necessary anymore? Or does art all only arise? Is it only necessary at this, at, at this part of human evolution that's, that's very messy? Yeah. The, you know, the ways to deal with the inexplicable, the unknowable. Yeah. So I sort of, you know, but you see where I'm going with yeah. that, I think, is that if, you know, we think, you know, art's been with us as long as we can imagine, but that doesn't mean it will be forever. I mean, we don't know what we become. I mean, I still think the, you know, however far out, whether it's a hundred years or a thousand years, if we survive, I guess we're going to survive in some way, shape or form, no matter how burnt the earth gets. You know, that post-biologic human is still human, I think. Yeah. I think. I really like how you put it on such a big cosmological perspective um, that you get to the point where um, is it that if digital superintelligence is what we're made to do, then what will, um, if we figure out how to embed consciousness into that um, digital superintelligence, if we help make it conscious, um, although all is conscious, that could it be then that then what is the purpose of if you can run all of the complex permutations of all art of all science of all different things like what will actually be happening uh, at that point how star trekian will it be what exactly will it be like um it's funny thinking that 2019 we're here having this conversation approaching 2020 and it's just so funny that um that we even use these two digits two zero two zero to describe this time after hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution that we're still just using this that's based on religion and that um you know even in several hundred years thinking about what to actually do with uh with time what people will do with time this persistent illusion of time more questions yeah although there's one that yes that i think following that is um you know some i mean Lawrence Doyle, who I spoke about, you know, one of my great friends and influences, you know, thinks that consciousness exists in the universe and we evolve to a place where we intersect with it. So not that we, the, the biologic us, you know, the sort of heliocentric us, that we evolve to a point to produce consciousness that perhaps, consci you know, if the universe is conscious, if the universe is thinking, then we evolve to a place to mesh, you know, to, to we become a node and all of a sudden we're alive within that. But it's very, it's very hard for us not to be anthropocentric. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's very difficult. It is, yeah. Yeah. The, the argument um, is that everything is already consciousness and that, um, that, that that is that deep interconnectedness but then there's also this um idea that um we ourselves are evolving our consciousness to um become more and more to become more and more aware to become more alive to become more transformed to grow more and some spiritual leaders call these densities that you move up in densities until then you make another cycle of creation and that these are just all games of creation that are being played for it's just such a beautiful very abstract um, idea that I hope can get disseminated better and better and awaken people to what the possibilities are. Well, are I mean, you got to think that there, there is an awakening going on now. I mean, look at the, the boom in, in psychedelics. I mean, a lot of the conversation around it is a conversation around healing and righting the damage. But, you know, there is also this idea of the, of the healthy person using the psychedelics to get to the next level. I mean, that's what I always... Mm -hmm thought of it you know for myself so i think there there is a, a you know there is a great awakening going on i think it's much more uh, pervasive than we even know but again you know the clock's ticking that that existential yeah clock is ticking so it's whether you know yeah 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 this is a big wisdom race are we going to be the wisdom able to race awaken yeah. on on time are we in a simulation? Sure. 
explain more. Well, what's the difference? I mean, how can we, we can't, we can't tell if we are, or if we aren't. And so I think what I, I would say, yes. Yeah. We did a whole episode on all is one simulation yeah. theory. It was a really good one. Everything yeah. is one. These are games of simulations that are being played by creation, blah, blah. It's very interesting. A simulation, you know, the language in English, it suggests something that's like fake mm. or not real, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. but that's, that's why, not what's in that's you know. why the word dream is used also by right. many in more indigenous yeah 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 what do you think is the most beautiful thing in this reality <laughs> the simulation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean what else could be what could be more beautiful than that yeah 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 the artist that coded the simulation yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a that's a that's a pretty fair there artist. You go. yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, all of creation. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a yeah, that's a very good all encompassing yeah, answer. Was that night yeah. jasmine that just was wafted through the room? That's oh yeah, life. there was some of that that just happened a little moment ago. Yeah. That's a good catch. Usually you gotta be in the tropics for that, but yeah, where did that just come happened? from? Mm. Yeah. Mm. That was so interesting. Wow. Boom. Yeah. Charles Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show. Alan, thank you. Really, it's what a pleasure. Such I a feel pleasure. like we just barely scratched the surface, <laughs> but I guess that's the nature of the deal. Yeah, thanks very much. Big oh pleasure. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. So good. Yeah, we got to a lot of the good depths of who you are, about art, about science, about the importance of storytelling, about all the different artists and residences, about recipes for the mind. I highly recommend everyone to check out the links in the bio below, charleslindsay.com. Also, go follow him on Instagram. Go check out the book, Recipes for the Mind, as well. That link's in the bio below. Be on the lookout for those uh, podcasts that are going to be dropped on every single one of the 108 um, uh, uh, recipes. Yeah, yeah, they are recipes. Like, I like that. Yeah, recipes. Yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> so check out those links. And then also do have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the topics that we talked about in the show, about the universe is thinking about meshing together art and science, spirituality, do have more conversations about that, everyone. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, all the different people, the organizations that you believe in, support them around the world, help them grow, help them flourish. You can find all of our links in our bio below to simulation, PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency, all those links are below. You can design cool merch and get paid all that stuff's below. Thank you, Ori Shapiro, for co-producing. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you very much. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Hopefully, this can Thanks. be used as a flag, like we said, to feature more Put of your incredible artists and scientists. I would love, love it. Love, love, it, so love it. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Let us know Good your night. thoughts in the comments. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Peace.